Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Kim Ryder. I'm uh, the Director of Operations here at the Wayne Theatre. And on behalf of our staff, our awesome ambassadors, and our board of directors, we welcome you here tonight. This is awesome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, oh, and I also want to say live streamers, thank you for joining us as well. This is great, guys. We're not alone. Um, so I wanted to just tell you, before we get started, a couple of great things that are happening here at the Wayne. Coming up this Friday night, we have Cirque Zuma Zuma. This is like a wonderful African Cirque du Soleil is what they're calling it. So there's dancing, there's fire, there's acrobats. It's going to be really, really exciting and wonderful right here on this stage. So Friday night at 7 o'clock, that's going to be happening. Uh, on March 4th, we have Jonathan Blanchard. He is an amazing singer. He's going to be doing a whole tribute to the basses, the voices, the Barry Whites and those guys. So that's just going to be a wonderful show as well. That's in March, March 4th. Um, we also have Studio Wayne. Studio Wayne is our arts education program. We have classes all the time, running all the time, for uh, people of all ages and uh, experience levels in arts. And so we, we invite you to go to our website and check out those and sign up for some classes because it's a really, really wonderful time. So without further ado, I'd like to continue on. And Mr. Joe Kuiper is going to take it from here. Thank you again for being here tonight. All right, thank you, Kim. Hey, so uh, Joe Kuiper, uh, Director of Virginia Museum of Natural History, wanted to take just a minute to tell you about where we're at with the construction of our campus to occur right down the road here. Um, we're doing good. So uh, uh, since I've last spoken to you, I think the last time I talked to you at this lecture series, the state had already moved money for our last phase of design uh, into an account, which is awesome because that means we now have permission to bring on architects and engineers to do the final decisions that need to be made, and that's going to occur over the next year or so. Uh, so uh, within the next upcoming weeks, we should have uh, this firm on board, and we're, it's going to be a really busy time. We're going to be picking out the specimens and artifacts that represent the wonderful natural history stories of this area. And uh, we're going to be picking out uh, the, the visitor flow, what goes in the classrooms, what does the laboratory look like? These are all different questions that are going to be answered. And I just want to say that this is not something that's just done by the Natural History Museum. I mean, we've used the, our partnership with the Wayne Theater to get our message out. Uh, we have the Center for Cold Waters Restoration, a local economic development nonprofit that has been such an incredible asset to us. Our university partners, including uh, we actually signed an MOU with John Carroll University. They're going to be our construction manager. What does that mean? That means that John Carroll and their expertise is going to be with us step by step along the way from here on out to ensure that when we break ground in the near future that we are doing everything just right. I, I think John Carroll has a little bit of expertise building buildings, Tom, from my That's visits to campus. All right. So, sorry. Uh, did I say John Carroll? I'm going back to my Cleveland days. Oh, goodness. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Let's back that up. John Carroll is a beautiful campus in Northeast Ohio, right next to where I used to work at the Cleveland Museum of, of Natural History, but James Madison University. Good grief. Thank you, Tom. All right, let's give James Madison a round of applause. So James Madison will be our construction manager, and they're very good at building buildings, so they will help us out. So all of these partnerships have made every step along the way possible. Um, and so in about a month, plus or minus, we're going to make an announcement regarding the architect and engineering firm. We'll bring on board with all the other uh, uh, collaborators that go with us, the exhibit design firm, the landscape design firm that will integrate with South River Preserve and whatnot. So not only that, we want to make sure that there is an opportunity for all of you to meet these people, to rub elbows with them, to find out the different projects they've worked on and so forth. So that's all coming up. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a very critical time uh, for this project. And uh, we should start to see new designs, new product, essentially, uh, upcoming here this spring. So we really look forward to it. In the meantime, let's focus our energy on vernal pools. Getting back to my time in Northeast Ohio is a very important habitat that we always explored, looking for those salamanders and so forth. But it's going to be um, uh, Dr. Tom Benzing. He is uh, a professor at John Carroll University. Uh, 
I just can't get that off my mind for some reason. So he is a professor at James Madison University. Sorry, Tom. They're going to be thinking about that, too. And he's also uh, past uh, chairman of the board of the Cleveland Museum. No, I'm kidding, right? I'm getting everything else wrong. I may as well mess that up, too. He's former chairman of the board of the Virginia Museum of Natural History and uh, is going to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Joe. And I'm, I'm wearing my purple tonight for two reasons. One, to represent JMU, but I also go to Waynesboro High School one day a week as our professor in residence at the high school and work with students. And of course, Waynesboro is also purple and gold. So um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, who is Stephen David, David Johnson. And I learned over dinner that, um, well, first of all, he teaches photography at Eastern Mennonite University, and he's been there for 16 years. But he did. Uh, his, his uh, educational work at uh, the Savannah College of Art and Design. And um, in our discussions over dinner, um, you know, we, we, this is a science speaker series, right? So why are we bringing a photographer here on board? We talked a little bit about STEM, and he said, well, it really should be STEAM because arts is part of that as well. And in fact, at EMU, I think it's very visionary that they're including uh, graphics and, and arts folks, uh, faculty in their science school. And so that's really cool. And uh, a lot of the themes that you're going to hear about tonight are important for understanding the science of vernal pools. Um, he lives with his wife, Anne Marie, in Broadway and uh, learned they have two daughters and uh, have inculcated them into uh, the natural sciences as well. And so please join me in welcoming Steve to the podium to talk about beneath vernal pools. Thank you so much for that introduction and thanks for the partners that invited me here tonight. It's, it's great to, to see you out and in person. This is the first time I've done an in-person talk like this for a good long time. So glad to see your faces. So in this presentation, I'll be sharing about my long-term photographic exploration of vernal pools and the amphibians that breed in them. To get started, I wanted to share a two minute film that features some of my footage from the field and is edited by my friend, filmmaker, Alex Wiles. Oh, also, I wanted to give a shout out to folks who are watching this via the live stream uh, and my friend, Lena Clemens, who's been following my work for many years. So, hey, Lena.
I'll just mention that uh, probably just about all of that footage was filmed within about 40 minutes of this theater, and some of it within about 15 minutes of this theater. So, yes? Yeah, I, I can see fine without really any lights at all. So what, however many you want to turn down is, is great. I'm going to turn down some more. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be able to see you. Okay. So I want to start off with a, a little background. In 2005, I moved to the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia to take a job teaching photography and digital media at Eastern Mennonite University. Nature photography provided me with a way of understanding my new place. Across the street at the North Fork of the Shenandoah, I met lots of new neighbors. And I grew to love watching them through the cycles of the seasons. But I soon discovered that not everything was well in my new neighborhood. Pollution and runoff contributed to fish kills in the Shenandoah River. And pipeline development threatened to fragment both the nearby George Washington National Forest and private farmland, posing a risk to some rare species, like the endemic cow knob salamander that you see here. As I learned about these threats, I also got to know the environmental organizations and researchers trying to address these issues. At the same time, I became familiar with the idea of conservation photography through the great work of the International League of Conservation Photographers based in DC. Conservation photography is kind of like nature photography plus. It takes nature photography and marries it with environmental advocacy and an ecosystems approach to understanding the natural world. Practicing this discipline has become a way of protecting and giving back to these landscapes that really sustain me. Which leads me back to vernal pools. My interest in conservation led to affiliations with the Virginia Herpetological Society and nonprofit groups like Wild Virginia and Virginia Wilderness Committee. Through field excursions with these organizations, I learned that the central and southern Appalachians are a biodiversity spot for salamanders with more than 50 species in Virginia alone. My uh, friend Mike Hazlett is in the audience right now. Mike, raise your hand out there. Mike is really the vernal pools expert here in Virginia, and I'm really grateful for him for teaching me about vernal pools 10, 12 years ago. I went on a field trip with him, and it was just eye-opening. There are such fascinating creatures that live just below the surface of these temporary ponds. Creatures like salamanders and frogs and some of the fairy shrimp that you saw in that video. That interest has led to a multi-year project that continues today. Over the last decade, I've developed underwater photography techniques to document this freshwater environment. That includes uh, vernal pools and also wetlands and rivers. And I've been developing a body of natural history photographic work that also intersects with my conservation photography projects. In early 2021, I partnered with the North American Nature Photography Association to release an ebook about documenting life in these temporary ponds. Mike contributed his writing on vernal pool conservation and geology and graciously allows me to draw on some of that information in presentations like this. If you're interested in learning more after this presentation, you can download the ebook for free at nampa.org slash handbooks. This past summer, I collaborated with the Nature Conservancy and writer Lindsay Lyles on a cover story about vernal pools. It's been fantastic to hear so many people who appreciate these environments and found this story meaningful. And as I said, it's a very local story. Tonight I want to introduce you to one other short film. 
This is another collaboration with my friend Alex Wiles, filmmaker. It's about the making of that ephemeral video. It gives you a little bit of the behind the scenes of these environments. My name is Steve Johnson. I'm a conservation photographer and a university professor. Conservation photography is nature photography plus using that photography for advocacy work, for protection of the natural world. I also think of it as having more of an ecosystems approach. So not just pretty pictures, but thinking about the big picture. With my conservation photography work, I moved to Virginia in 2005, and pretty soon I discovered that the biodiversity story here was salamanders. We have more than 50 species in Virginia alone. So I realized if I was gonna be telling stories about the natural world, it was gonna involve salamanders. I became really fascinated. I, I wanted to understand what their life cycles were about and document this portion of their life when they came above ground and went to these pools to breathe. And that's what's led me to the last nine years of a vernal pools project. Vernal pools are special because they're ephemeral. They, they don't last, they're, they're seasonal. So it's only at certain times of the year that you're gonna see water in them. And that keeps them fish free. And because they don't have fish in them, there's a whole range of amphibians that can breed in there in relative safety. So you have some really unique environments. I use video lights and macro photography and underwater cameras to try to bring people much closer to these creatures. And when you see them in detail, they're amazing looking. They're like the types of things you might find in a tropical coral reef, but they're right here in the Appalachian woods. North America has the highest biodiversity of salamanders found anywhere in the world. Here in Appalachia, we have this amazing diversity of these creatures. Sometimes I think of them like hidden dragons. So in addition to salamanders, you can find macroinvertebrates, you can find crustaceans. I photograph things like berry shrimp, tiny little copepods, daphnia, beetle larvae, dragonfly larvae, caddisfly larvae. There's all sorts of things that are completing life stages. It's a kind of hidden diversity that most people don't see in it unless they know what to look for. So in part two, I wanted to get into some of the details of some of these creatures that live in vernal pools. On rainy spring evenings, the Appalachian forest wakes. Eastern newts waddle across the snow, and wood frogs call like quacking ducks. This little phone video gives you a sense of that quack-like call as they begin the breeding season. Pool salamanders, having spent much of the year underground, emerge and migrate to their breeding pools. For herpetologists, one of the most striking things about vernal pool environments is the part they play in the life cycles of several species of salamanders in the Ambystema genus. Vernal pools form from seasonal rains and snowmelt. These temporary bodies of water are ideal environments for egg laying since they're free from most predator fish. These environments are quite diverse in makeup and include pristine natural environments with rare species like this large sinkhole pond in Maple Flats, just down the road. Or the small rock line pool next to a trout stream in the George Washington National Forest. Just a word about size. I mean, some of these pools I can literally reach across. They're, they're almost glorified puddles. There's also human-made wildlife watering holes. These can function like vernal pools to some degree, supporting species like spotted and Jefferson salamanders. However, true natural vernal pools or even reconstructed intentional vernal pools may support higher biodiversity. These vernal pool and bistema salamanders spend much of the year underground emerging for breeding events that are usually triggered by rain. This can be in the fall, winter, or spring, depending on their species. After these breeding events, luminous egg clusters often dot the vernal pool environment. 
This is in uh, Augusta County also. Creatures that rely on vernal pools for their life cycles are called obligate or indicator species. Because vernal pools are temporary, as I mentioned, they usually don't support fish. And it's this feature that allows these obligate species, such as spotted salamanders, to breed in these pools in relative safety. There's a continuum. Some of the obligate species listed here can be found in other wetland environments, depending on geography and circumstances. One type of obligate species, marbled salamanders, are fall breeders. On rainy autumn evenings, these really elegant monochromatic salamanders emerge from underground and trek towards the edges of depressions that will eventually fill to become vernal pools. After breeding, female marbled salamanders lay their eggs beneath logs or leaves in these depressions. The adults will eventually return underground. Female marbled salamanders display a silvery gray hue, which you can see on the left, while the males have bands that are nearly white. It's fascinating to see a creature with such stark zebra-like patterns among the earth tones of the forest floor. When the ponds fill, fringy gilled marbled salamander larvae are the first salamanders on the scene. The gills that you see assist with oxygen intake. They are voracious little predators. They feast on copepods, berry shrimp, and other smaller salamander larvae that begin their development later in the season. In this video, the tiny orange creatures that you see flitting around are copepods, a type of crustacean. Daphnia and fairy shrimp also appear in the sea. Fairy shrimp are a type of crustacean that are also an obligate species of vernal pools. Interesting, I pulled out this quote here from Mike. The indestructible eggs of the fairy shrimp survive the acidic digestive tract of the waterfall. waterfowl. They can dry up and be transported by, by ducks, and that's how they can move from pool to pool. Really fascinating natural history. In this image, a marble salamander is actually preying on one of the fairy shrimps, so you get a sense of their scale, that tail sticking out. Sometimes when I'm out exploring these pools at night, I'll just see clouds of berry shrimp swimming in the pools and clouds of copepods. It's really amazing how much biodiversity is there. This blue circle shows one individual copepod. So one of the things that I ran into as a limitation as a photographer, even with a good macro lens, that's about as close as I was getting to a copepod. So a couple of years ago, I purchased an ultra macro lens, which I can get up to five times life size. And with that, I was finally able to see what a copepod really looks like. So one of the things about photography is that sometimes it allows you to see things that you simply can't see with your naked eye. And you can go back later on in your processing software and your photo library and start to see the details emerge. And that's so fascinating. Here's another ultra macro view of the copepod showing its one blue eye. Sometimes people actually refer to them as cyclops. Studying photographs in detail can also help with ID. So note on the left, the marbled salamander larva with its darker coppery eyes and a really distinct row of whitish spots versus the spotted salamander on the right with a more golden type of eyes. Eventually, the marbled larvae emerge from the pond as juveniles, looking like smaller versions of adults. And eventually, they'll complete that same life cycle. December through February can be a perfect time to find tiger salamanders breeding in icy cold water. This is happening right now. Tiger salamanders are obligate species, regionally relying on vernal pools in Appalachian, Virginia.
But in other regions, they can be facultative species, breeding in other environments, such as wetlands. In Virginia, they're under threat from wetlands development, but a few populations hold on. In fact, I mentioned the pipeline. Uh, before that project was killed, the uh, route of the pipeline, its access road was gonna go within 500 feet of one of these ponds, uh, very close to here. While tiger salamanders are common in some parts of the country, the eastern species can be scarce in some states. And in Virginia, they're considered to be state endangered. Ambystoma tigrinum are the largest of the mole salamanders. They cut a pretty impressive figure with their bright speckled eyes and mottled patterns. And their muscular, strongly keeled tail. Most eastern tiger salamanders in Virginia are coastal, but there's a tiny relic population in Augusta County, real close to Waynesboro, and it's part of an ancient group that dates back to the Pleistocene. Another salamander, Jefferson salamanders, emerge in the early spring from their forest refuges and travel to vernal pools for their own breeding events. My friend and fellow photographer, Dave Huth, contributed this fantastic locomotion study to our Vernal Pools ebook. Here you can see a comparison between Jefferson and spotted salamander. Note the plain grayish coloration of the Jefferson versus uh, some of the spotted salamanders you see on the top left. I find their toes so alien looking. Females lay their eggs in oblong clusters, often attached to stems below the surface of the vernal pools. With careful periodic observation, you can watch the embryos, embryos develop in successive stages through the transparent egg capsules. This is an ultra macro image of a Jefferson salamander embryo in one of its stages of development. And then shown at the same scale, a spotted salamander, which is the egg on the left, shows a much larger capsular chamber surrounding the embryo when compared with the Jefferson salamander egg. Another example of studying the details when you actually get your photographs back, helping you understand ID and the kind of differentiation that's here. The embryos continue to develop and eventually the larvae emerge, this time distinguished by their bright golden eyes and mottled tails. February through April, so again, we're right there, is spotted salamander season in Virginia. With their iconic polka-dotted skins, spotted salamanders are really emblematic of the vernal pool world. Here's a close-up of one underwater during a breeding event in Augusta County. I love their smiles. During these breeding events, males deposit what are called spermatophores, these kind of popcorn-looking things you see here that contain their genetic material. So these are on the bottoms of the pools, and females will go in and pick them up. Here's an ultra macro image. You can see the structure of one of those spermatophores. And over on the far left that is a tiny copepod next to it. It's probably about one millimeter high. Female spotted salamanders deposit their eggs in these kind of luminous clusters below the surface of the water. This was actually a really exciting moment for me to observe. Uh, my wife is in the audience, Anna Maria, and she was out with me that night, and she'd tell you I was pretty much jumping up and down for joy because I had wanted to document this very moment, and I could see it from the edge of the shore, uh, and I realized I had just a few seconds to, to make the image. So uh, just as an aside, I actually practice in my home office beforehand on Star Wars figures. So I know I often I'll have, in the field only have a a real small window to make certain images. So I get the lighting situations right on Yoda and Hammerhead. 
They're good stand-ins for salamanders. The egg masses that they lay often stand out in this really extraordinary relief from the background of moss or leaves, this time in a private pond in Augusta County. In this image, multiple egg masses can be seen just below the surface of a small rock-lined vernal pool in the George Washington National Forest, this time in Rockingham County. And here's a detail underwater. In this video, wood frog tadpoles swim in great numbers in front of a backdrop of spotted salamander eggs. And I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the relationships that develop between other types of creatures and these egg masses, including things like predation. These egg masses can be really, really otherworldly and beautiful in a very abstract sort of way. When illuminated directly, they appear as tiny worlds edged with these delicate blue halos. Numerous creatures prey on spotted salamander egg masses. These include eastern newts, like the ones you see here, wood frog tadpoles, and even insects like caddisfly larvae, looking very alien here. Predators and prey have co-evolved to take full advantage of these ephemeral ponds. Some creatures make use of egg masses as a kind of staging ground for predation, resembling diminutive anemones, freshwater hydras can latch onto the surfaces, such as these egg masses, where they feed on other minuscule creatures, such as copepods and seed shrimp. Recent research has demonstrated that while hydras may be killed, they do not die of old age. I love learning about these other creatures along the way. They're such fascinating life histories. And of course, watching the embryos develop here can also be fascinating. As a spotted salamander embryo develops inside an individual egg, photosynthetic algae also grow inside the egg capsule. This gradually alters the color balance to a vibrant yellow-green. Within the egg capsule, the algae help to provide oxygen. Researcher Ryan Kearney has discovered that the algae even grow inside the living cells of the embryo a first discovery for a vertebrate species. What this new algae relationship means is still an active source of research, but seems to involve a shift from photosynthesis to a kind of fermentation reaction. And how that benefits or harms the creatures, like the algae, what do the algae get out of it? That's still open for some research and debate. So understanding the science, starts to change what you perceive in these environments. Those bright green shades are not only visually striking, they're an indication of an ancient sort of relationship. And there are other kind of interesting natural history things to note in these, these eggs too. For example, these are all spotted salamander eggs, but the one on the far left is opaque, whereas most of these are transparent. Of course, uh, as a photographer, the transparent ones are a lot more fun to photograph, but well, you know, why is this? One theory is that the clear egg mass is better for algae development because of the photosynthesis, whereas the opaque version might be better for resisting predation. So there may be evolutionary reasons for both of these, and it's kind of a test case out in nature to see what happens. With periodic trips back to the pools, you might encounter larvae that are just about ready to hatch. And here you can see the algae starting to slough away. And then a, a larva in the process of leaving its egg capsule. Once they leave their egg capsule, they kind of shoot down to the bottom of the pool and look like this. Golden eyes, speckled appearance, they're trying to stay hidden under the leaf litter during the day. 
Now, this is a salamander that I have rather limited experience with, but I thought I'd throw it into this slideshow because I, I did just a little bit of work over my sabbatical from EMU. So maybe salamanders live outside of the Shenandoah Valley near the coast. During my sabbatical, I traveled to Newport News and met up with a Virginia State herpetologist and an intern to explore a, a ponds complex there. Later, I traveled with that same intern to another pond surrounded by subdivisions. It was really surreal to witness a number of these fairly rare, maybe salamanders, swimming around surrounded by the trappings of suburbia. We were just out in this pond and there were suburban houses all around us. So I hope to have a chance to explore these salamanders in the future. They're really quite elegant and a, a very different sort of environment than what I'm used to right here in the valley. Frogs. So another type of obligate species, wood frog adults, can freeze nearly solid in the winter months with a kind of natural antifreeze that keeps their internal organs from crystallizing. Wood frogs are typically the first frogs to emerge in early spring. They're explosive breeders, sometimes filling an entire section of a pond with thousands and thousands of eggs, like what you see here. I found this wood frog resting on a spotted salamander egg mass in a vernal pool. It seemed very uninterested in me and allowed me to approach quite close to make this image. It kind of felt like it was resting on a cloud. As wood frog tadpoles hatch, they nibble at algae, covering the egg masses they've left behind before turning their appetites to nearby spotted salamander eggs. Over the course of months, I've observed hungry wood frog tadpoles scouring a small pool down to the bare rock. From above the surface, wood frog tadpoles can look small and dark and nondescript. But when viewed with a light at close range, the intricate golden filigree pattern of their skin becomes apparent. Facultative species. So these are species that use vernal pools to breed or hunt, but don't require them. So in addition to vernal pool locations, these species can be found in other environments, such as permanent ponds and river shallows. Eastern newts are ubiquitous presidents in Appalachian forests. Their skin contains toxin that makes them unpalatable to predators, including fish. Another uh, study of locomotion by my friend Dave just love to see their twisting motion in the water. Their toxic nature allows them to live in permanent ponds and rivers as well as in vernal pools. They also have a fascinating life cycle. So after courtship, their eggs hatch into aquatic larvae. But if the conditions are right, these newts enter a terrestrial stage in which they transform into bright orange, round-tailed, red Fs. And if you ever see a salamander just wandering around during the daytime, this is probably what you're seeing. Uh, that orange is an indication of toxicity to their predators. So when other salamanders are safely tucked away under cover objects during the day, these guys on a moist day are just wandering around through the forest. My friend Dave actually studied dorsal spot patterns in the red F stage in Western New York State. Such a great photographic study and he actually found that the average was nine spots. In case you ever want to know. Four-toed salamanders live in mossy wetlands that may include the edge of vernal pools. I've found, found them living near natural pools and next to constructed water holes, as well as wet areas at the base of mountain seeps. Females deposit eggs in the moss, and the embryos develop in this moist but still terrestrial environment. Here's something really interesting about four-toed salamanders, their bellies. So they have these bright white bellies, bellies that are punctuated with dark spots, making them really easy to distinguish from other kinds of salamanders. Also cover a, a few common facultative frog species. 
like the spring peepers shown here. Their Latin name, Crucifer, comes from the X-shaped marking on their back. While peepers are common and loud, their small size and earth tone bodies can make them very difficult to actually locate. If you've ever had the experience of looking for peepers, you can have thousands of them surrounding you and finding one can take a long time. Their piercing call is a sure sign of spring in the eastern US. In the video that follows, you can hear one peeper beginning to call while American toads are trilling in the background. I've visited vernal pools where thousands of peepers have been calling at once. The noise is deafening and you can feel the vibrations, kind of like electricity in your body. I've literally taken uh, lawnmower earmuffs and worn them out in the field so I don't go deaf. So much energy in a tiny little package. And this is in Augusta County also. Just impossible to do it justice with the sound system, uh, but thousands, thousands of peepers here. You just feel it in your body. Tiny northern cricket frogs are another type of facultative species. They feature cryptic coloring that helps them to blend in with leaves and moss. While I might not spot them immediately, dozens will dart into the water as I skirt the edges of one of my favorite sinkhole vernal pool complexes, which happens to be Maple Flats, just down the road. Green frogs and bullfrogs are common species that may also be found at vernal pools. Green frogs are summer breeders. They have a distinctive banjo-like twang for their call. While green frogs might look similar to bullfrogs at first glance, here's how you can tell them apart. Their dorsolateral ridge, which is a fancy word for the raised skin just beyond the eye, extends almost to the back of their legs. In bullfrogs, this ridge ends just beyond the tympanum, also known as the ear membrane. The bullfrog is the largest frog species in North America. It's found in a wide variety of habitats. They're native to the eastern United States, but were introduced to the American West, where they're now considered to be invasive. So uh, this takes us just a little bit away from vernal pools, but uh, a few years back, our youngest daughter created a backyard pond for us as a school high school project. She dug it by hand with a shovel, and we went from having one species, which was American toads, to having eight species within the course of about two years. So now every summer, we, we go out to the pond and watch things happen. That's uh, my daughter Maggie's sketchbook. She's been doing a very careful record of all the frogs she sees there and their relationships. She has names for them all. American toads breed in vernal pools, rivers, permanent ponds, and even puddles. In our backyard, the high-pitched trilling calls of male toads competing to breed can be heard through much of the spring, as you'll hear in the next video. My favorite part about that is actually seeing the visible frequency of its call in the water. I love it too, you can, you can see them sort of gathering up their energy for that call. And that leads to this. Uh, called amplexus and frogs, uh, the males are like little backpacks on the uh, great big females. 
This time, this is in a riverine environment in the North Fork of the Shenandoah. Females lay large strings of eggs, which hatch into extremely small tadpoles. Development time is relatively quick, and the little toadlets will soon roam the forest floors. Invertebrates. So vernal pool invertebrates include crustaceans. We've seen some of those already, like copepods and fairy shrimp. And you saw this one in the video. I thought it'd be worth coming back to. So seed shrimp, also known as ostracods, are here, a type of crustacean. Here they're photographed in front of a single wood frog egg. So that gives you a sense of their really tiny scale. Daphnia are named after the mythological nymph Daphne, who was turned into a laurel tree after an unwanted pursuit from the god Apollo. Also known as water fleas, these tiny animals feature antennae resembling branches, and they have translucent bodies, just millimeters long. Really beautiful creatures. Look like little, little floating jewels. And of course, there are many types of insects in vernal pools. In the video, I mentioned uh, a number of larvae that complete their life cycle, dragonfly larva, uh, beetle larva. There are diving beetles and water boatmen. Uh, some animals live as adults. Some just complete their life cycles as part of the vernal pool process. And they can also be voracious predators, sometimes uh, attacking tadpoles or young larvae. Hey, I wanted to point out just a, a few resources if you're continuing to be interested in this topic, and of course I'll, I'll take questions too. So if you want to know more, you can go to my website, stephendavidjohnson.com, or if you want to download our free PDF about this topic, nampa.org slash handbooks, either place will get you there eventually. The book includes a lot more about the photography. So if you're interested in how I made these images, a bit about underwater photography and the equipment and lighting that I use, that's all in the book. And these are a couple of my students from EMU I took out in the field. The book also contains a section about conservation. Uh, some of that was authored by my friend Mike in the audience. There are many threats to vernal pools right now. That includes things like wetland, development, I mentioned industrial pipelines, climate change is another factor. Mike's told me that back in the day, a few decades ago, he could almost predict down to the day when there was going to be a big night when all the spring breeders would come out at once and there might be hundreds or even thousands of them. That's all changed. It's very fragmentary now. So that's one thing that, that climate change has, has already done. It's made the weather less predictable. It's made the pools less predictable. Uh, also, amphibian diseases have affected both frogs and salamanders. Some of you may be familiar that we've actually had a, a ban on most salamander species as part of the pet trade in the last few years to try to cut down on that infection. Uh, finally, series of website resources that you might find helpful. You're welcome to screenshot that or you can download the book and that includes those resources too. So if you want to know more in particular about regional vernal pool resources, lots of great stuff here, including things like protocols for disinfecting gear. So when I go out to different pools and different watersheds, I use a bleach solution on my waders about 10% to make sure I'm not transmitting disease. Another resource you see here, the Virginia Herpetological Society. It's a great collection of uh, enthusiasts who love everything related to snakes, and salamanders, and frogs. If you want to know about any species that are here in Virginia, great resource. I hope this presentation has inspired you to explore the remarkable world of vernal pools, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you.
not sure if I can get to everybody with a microphone, but I'll try so that our audience online can hear us too. Is the time that the egg is laid to the time that they're land land worthy uh, salmon, or is that about the same as a tadpole? Uh, I would say usually a little bit quicker. Uh, well, it depends a bit on the species, so, and the tadpole, I guess. So uh, toad tadpoles are very quick, but there are certain other species, like uh, bullfrogs, can actually overwinter, sometimes overwinter multiple seasons. So if you've ever seen a bullfrog tadpole that's huge, it's probably stayed in that pond for a couple of years. Uh, that's not usually the case with, uh, with salamanders, usually they, they hatch earlier. Although there are some cases of certain types of salamanders who will stay in a kind of um, juvenile stage where they can reach sexual maturity, but they look like juveniles. So there's all sorts of exceptions in, in this world. It really depends on the species. Do you have any uh, tips for someone who wanted to uh, construct a vernal pool? So you happen to have probably one of the best experts in the US on that topic right here, which is Mike Hazlett. Uh, Mike, do you mind fielding that question? Sure. <laughs> And that begs the question, how long do salamanders live? Yeah, uh, I mean, it really, again, depends on the species. I mean, some of the longer uh, lived vernal pool salamanders can live up to a couple decades. Uh, hellbenders, which we've got not too far from here, can live quite a bit longer than that. Some of the, the largest salamander species, I, I think, can live up to uh, 70 years or more. What, what happens to all the little um, fairy shrimp and all that kind of thing when the pools dry up? Yeah, so they, they don't have long lives. Uh, yeah, they, they, they live for a season and that's it. Their eggs, though, as I mentioned, can survive when they're dried up and can be resurrected when there's water or taken by waterfowl somewhere else. I've actually seen them living in puddles on the road. So mm -hmm. I guess that must have been because waterfowl visited there and left a few eggs in there and not enough vehicles went through there to splash the puddle dry. Right. <laughs> Other questions? I've always heard that uh, amphibian and salamanders in particular are good indicators of the uh, environment. Mm -hmm. um, would you say the populations are healthy or how would you describe that for say our area? Yeah, I mean, in some ways it's a, it's a hard question to answer because you know what scientists refer to as shifting baseline syndrome. I mean, what, whatever's come before us in the last you know, generation is kind of what we think of as being normal. Uh, so even for, you know, for me and for Mike, we have a few years between us, that baseline is a little bit different. I mean, I would say since I've started doing this project, I haven't noticed significant shifts, but that's a very small study area. Uh, certain types of species around the world have been decimated by amphibian fungal diseases. Uh, 
So there's really an amphibian crisis worldwide. Do you have any advice for <clears throat> ethically going out and exploring some of these mm -hmm. vulnerables? Yeah. Okay, so as one thing as I mentioned, um, you know, if I'm actually setting foot in a pool, I'm disinfecting gear. Uh, I think a big thing is just paying lots of attention, watching where you step. If I'm out on a rainy night, you know, I'm, I'm walking like this with a flashlight because anything could be underfoot. So developing your observation skills. When I can in the smaller pools, I actually just work from the shore. Uh, I'll perch on a rock, dip my camera in the water. That's not always possible. So when I'm in the pools, I'm again, just scanning with my flashlight, moving very slowly and deliberately. I think a lot of it's getting to know your subject too. How do they react to you? Where are they likely to be? Being a uh, caver for more than 50 years, I'm mm -hmm. curious if you've ever been underground to some of the, I don't know if you'd call them vernal pools and caves, but we do have life in some of these pools. And I'm thinking about one specific cave not far from here, um, Madison Saltpeter which was recently acquired by the Cave Conservancy of Virginia, so it's owned by cavers, mm -hmm. it's next to Grand Caverns. And there is a species-specific isopod that was identified to one of the pools in there. It's very, very rare, but have you ever thought about going into the true dark and continuing your research? Uh, yes, and I have. Uh, actually looking for an isopod. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, on that particular trip, I didn't find it. All I found so a lot of other interesting um, invertebrates. Uh, I would love to spend some time with cave salamanders too. So you have some connections? Uh, I'd love to have your card and do some more cave work in the future. Excellent. Any other questions for Steve? I'm sure he'd be happy to stick around and chat with folks individually if you'd like to come up afterwards. and. Join me in thanking one more time Steve for his presentation tonight. Thanks so much.